Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Enterprise Architecture Summit presentation. My name is Melissa Craig. I'm the Vice President of American Operations um, here in the US. Our next presentation is Effective Communication for Enterprise Architectural architecture professionals, and it's presented by Avolution's own Doreen Dickman. Doreen's a highly regarded consultant within the Abacus community. She's able to combine her previous real world experience as an enterprise architect with her Abacus expertise, which is really helpful um, for a lot of our customers to, to be able to understand um, the tool. Today, she will discuss the importance of a strong relationship with business stakeholders to an EA practice and provide practical guidelines and communication prompts to help architects be able to deliver productive conversations across the business. Uh, before I hand it over to Doreen, just want to go over a few housekeeping issues so that we can keep today's event moving forward smoothly. Um, if you would like to ask questions, and we would absolutely love it if you do, the best way to do that is to write questions in the Q&A box, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. Um, our intention today is to answer as many questions as possible, and we'll do that at the end of the presentation. If you have any general comments that you want to state, rather, as opposed to questions, uh, you can use the chat feature for those, but we would prefer the Q&A feature for actual questions. Um, also, please note, today's event is being recorded, as are all of our sessions. So if you do need to leave earlier, if you have any technical difficulties or anything like that, everyone who's registered for our summit will receive the recording and link to download the slides in a few days' time. So Doreen, if you're ready to go, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Melissa, for that introduction. So hello again and welcome. Um, and first, I do want to thank you all for being here today because I realize it's not always easy to step away from your work. So I really hope you'll find this topic useful and are able to apply it in your de uh, daily EA practice. Um, as Melissa said, I'm Doreen Dickman and I do work for Evolution. I've been an enterprise architect for about 10 years and I've been through the maturity levels from startup EA through EA adoption um, to a working EA and then to consulting EA. So this session is about effective communication for enterprise architecture professionals. And more to the point, I'll be sharing some tips and tricks that'll help you hack your way to effective communication. One might be tempted to call this a general use session, but effective communication or the lack of it can make or break the perceived value of enterprise architecture practices. Considering that an enterprise architecture is a means to provide intelligence, like impacts, dependencies, or risks about current and future states, enterprise architecture adoption is a rising trend among businesses. Enterprise architects, domain architects, solution architects, and others looking out for the health and integrity of the enterprise architecture need to be prepared with the soft skills that position them to interact professionally with stakeholders across the functions of an organization. Especially considering that these may be stakeholders holding key architecture drivers and information that you need, and they are the ones who need intelligence and insights from the enterprise architecture to make key decisions. So some of these stakeholders could prove to be your best advocates. McKinsey urges that architects move away from pictures that emphasize structure and systems and focus on the language business stakeholders would use like risk, return on investment, impact, and so on. To support the recommendation, their survey, a McKinsey survey, uncovered that the most important personal develop areas for people working on the enterprise architecture are not technical. Technical software and tools as a rated category is actually far down the list in the second to the last position. And interestingly, at third place, there's a tie between business topics and problem solving. So based on the ranking gap between technical software and tools in the second to the last position, which is fourth place, and the two tied in third place, it could be suggested that problem solving as a skill 
is related to solving business problems and not about solving problems relating to traditional IT, typically involving applications and technology. And that's an interesting thought for EAs, right? So this is just some of McKinsey's work on the subject of interpersonal skills. But all the analysts and publications have ideas around soft skills and communicating. Gartner, Forbes, CIO.com, Scale to Agile, and more. So there are hundreds of published ideas, theories, tried and true techniques, and tried and failed techniques for communicating. And we thought it'd be interesting and maybe a little fun to pull together some ideas that might be a little less top of mind as a way to hack your way to more effective communications. So being that the McKinsey survey rated interpersonal skills and professional competence the highest, understanding your audience, audiences, is where the rubber hits the road. Soft skills of varying degrees are a must. So first, take note that this slide is titled audiences, plural. As enterprise architects, you have a cross-cutting viewpoint of the enterprise. So on any given day, your audience may be direction setters whose interests are stretch goals and the bottom line, or operations leads, or people who look for efficiencies and synergies with upstream and downstream processes, or they may be of any of the functional roles that pour through data upon data to uncover duplication, risk, and cost savings opportunities. Enterprise architects need the ability to talk the talk on a wide array of business topics, as McKinsey called out. Regarding the language of business, terms like function, service, or goal, they might seem innocuous and simple. But how business terms are used across an organization can actually become so diverse that terms can drive a wedge between architects and business stakeholders. Or terms can unite architects and business. One of the best ways to develop unity with your stakeholders is through a common language, and namely, it's theirs. Agree on business terms to be used and with definitions, especially because team makeup changes frequently. You can win respect by being flexible and accepting their established terms. Your aim is to not be disruptors. And also, it is important to avoid teaching moments. When we use academic speak like frameworks, meta models, constraints, yada, yada, business stakeholders, they'll most likely tune that out. And worse yet, they'll find creative ways to circumvent you in the future. So as harsh as it may seem, stakeholders don't need or don't want to know what architecture terms mean. That's your job. And if you do try to explain it, it's like the saying about teaching a pig to fly. You can't do it and it'll annoy the pig. So let's look at a hack that helps with finding a way for architects and business stakeholders to engage with thoughtful discussion and deter anxiety. This is about zooming out. It is the business that generates the concerns where enterprise architects need to deliver value. But it's very common for the business to describe their challenges and needs at a very small grain, like pain points in individual process steps. And to enterprise architects, these really granular task level problems may not seem architecturally significant at face value. But don't get me wrong, your stakeholders, they're very knowledgeable and very good at what they do. I mean, they've already pinpointed the exact task moment or data point where they're taking a hit. And sure, it'd be great to solve each and every one of their detailed problems. But enterprise architects, know this is best done through a holistic business outcome lens. Diving into these siloed pits of baseless details is overwhelming at best and paralyzing at worst when a business outcome isn't the objective. 
Architects with mature interpersonal skills, as McKinsey recommends, could invite stakeholders to zoom out. If you develop your ability to subtly coach stakeholders, lead the witness, so to speak, you'll want them to first talk about their own business measures, the metrics or performance indicators they're accountable for within the enterprise. Think of measurables like speed, error rate, costs, customer ratings, things like that. This is where we enterprise architects hang out, right? Quantitative impact to business outcomes, ultimately forming a picture of value in the enterprise. So from that viewpoint, how would you say their outcomes are impacted by their challenges and unmet needs? When you help stakeholders frame their challenges and needs in relation to how they measure or should measure themselves, you do effectively zoom out from the detail of pain points and frustrations. Those larger grained business outcome concern have metrics and performance indicators. Indicators of success that could be planned for, executed against, and yes, measured. When enterprise architects and business stakeholders unite and communicate on this zoomed out perspective of measurable business outcomes, it's a shared win. Business will have quantified their challenges and needs for long-term measurable improvement. And for architects, you showcase your value by helping the business realize their goals and support strategic direction. And this will earn you repeat business. But on a side note, it's very important to have the right stakeholder to use this zoom out hack. Because if your stakeholder isn't responsible or accountable for any certain measures, or if the stakeholder really just can't conceive of this zooming out idea, you know, think larger, it's best to look for a business stakeholder with those abilities. Okay, maybe less of a hack and more of a professional must um, is sharing your audience's concerns. And full acknowledgement, that's not always simple because as we saw earlier, Enterprise architects work with mixed roles across the organization, and each role has different accountabil accountabilities and goals, their concerns. So rest assured, this is not a session on design thinking or solution architecture, but this comment from Scaled Agile on design thinking highlights customer perspective. At Avolution, we think the perceived value of architect involvement to a great degree stems from the architect's ability to understand stakeholders' concerns, that you get them, you get their needs, you empathize. So the hack here is to contain discussions to your stakeholders' business concerns. And in practice, it means speaking about or demonstrating items in their scope of business like their operational processes, their goals, or their outcomes. But that can be hard, right? The enterprise architecture is big, it's complex, and impact can come from any direction, oh my. But whatever lions and tigers and bears you might be dealing with, it helps if you can see them in order to tame, in order to tame them. And what I'm talking about is clarity. And you can have clarity by leading on your architecture meta model. More precisely, lean on bits and pieces of your meta model. What I'm saying is to chunk up that big, hairy meta model into small, relatable bits. And then think of those bits as guardrails or guidelines, something that helps you align clearly with your stakeholders' perspective. And there is that perspective word again that scaled Agile used. So what do I mean by that in practice? Here are a few chunks of that big hairy architecture meta model to demonstrate the guardrail idea. Each of these only has a subset of related architecture elements. And we know because an enterprise architecture is ultimately all connected, it's okay to focus on just pieces and parts of it 
when you need to. Abacus gives you complete control over how much or how little to include in these little helpful chunks to help you effectively communicate on your stakeholders level and perspective. Like the zooming out pack, it's another way to prevent that dreaded analysis paralysis. And just something else to chew on. Architects suffer from the curse of knowledge, meaning when you have knowledge, it's impossible to imagine what it's like to lack that knowledge. Whether we realize it or not, the depth and breadth of what someone knows can affect their ability to have focused discussions. Like when we, you just knew of so many possibilities that could be contributing to an issue, like this poor stakeholders outage problem, that it was a challenge for you to be present in the moment and hear her story. Capturing the issue or entertaining her desired state, those were just not your focus because your brain was cluttered and consumed with a larger picture of causation, remediation, and impact. You likely dismissed your stakeholder and her perspective and didn't even realize it. But when you use the tricks of your trade, like chunking up your architecture, you can better contain conversations to the right scope and then triumph over your curse of knowledge. Another trick of your trade is to leverage viewpoints. Now, viewpoint is a concept used in the TOGAF standard. It's a way to tailor architecture information to specific audiences. Well, Abacus parallels that concept by allowing architects to govern precisely what architecture elements are allowed in diagrams and how they will appear visually. So in essence, it's another way to partition and present the architecture to align with stakeholder perspectives. Oops, there's that perspective word again. So to see viewpoints in action and why they matter to different stakeholders, we'll look at a scenario where you need to give your CIO a strategy viewpoint into the enterprise architecture. We'll use the graph visualization in enterprise because it's a dynamic, uh, it's a dynamic view of the architecture and it allows stakeholders to drill into and traverse the architecture. So the visual actually starts out okay in the business motivation realm. But boom, you see now it has ended up being like the Energizer Bunny. It keeps going and going and going. The unwitting architect configured this graph using a viewpoint that allows every single component in the enterprise architecture to be presented to the CIO. So Abacus doesn't mind. It'll happily traverse over, under, and through the entire architecture all day long. But the CIO does mind. You let them drill so far into the architecture, they're seeing servers, network elements, and other things outside their interest as communicating goes. And this isn't just a mixed message, it's no message at all. It's completely alienated your CIO from any value they were hoping to get from working with an enterprise architect. Yep, you overwhelmed them. But compare that mashup to the precision and clarity of the message in this graph view. Because the abacus viewpoint is contained to the CIO's interests, you can see how small that is compared, the visualization sticks tightly to goals, risk remediation, the projects doing so, and the business capabilities impacted. So between these, it should be very easy to figure out which of the two best suits the CIO's interest. For communication hacks, we talked about understanding your audiences, how what they do and are accountable for should guide discussion content, using the language of business when they're spec by adopting their terms, steering clear of enterprise architecture academia, sharing concerns by adopting their perspective and empathizing with their challenges and needs, by zooming out, using business outcomes and measures 
to engage and show EA value. And by leaning on your meta model and viewpoints, using the expertise of your trade to contain and tailor the right information to the right stakeholders. So as hacks go, these ideas sort of frame your communication so you can listen more freely and fully understand their challenges and needs, clear signs of professional competence, and a path to bond valuable relationships with business and other stakeholders. But what's also important is the message itself. How should you structure your message for maximum effectiveness? As audiences go, if you can share your message quickly and neatly and leave no gaps in terms of expectations and outcomes, you've respected their time and satisfied their need for knowledge at the level they operate in. If we could hack our way into that reality, let's look at a few things we can do. In our fast paced days, it's easy to overlook the basics of messaging like completeness, courtesy, and how to make a request for action. A great deal of the time, it's just a few bits of information that's needed to craft a message that'll accomplish what you need. Number one, state your point and call to action. And if there is a call to action, be specific on the decision you want them to make. Number two, tell a story or provide an example to explain the point, but keep it simple. A number of reasons, four reasons, six reasons, nine reasons, nine reasons aren't necessarily more convincing than just one or two reasons. Number three, for abstract concepts or for proof of an idea or situation, use simple data like percentages, summaries, and even metaphors. Because your message likely isn't a full disclosure, it's a technique to inform, persuade, or request. Number four, restate your main point, especially if some in your audience frequent the short attention span theater. And don't forget number five, do thank your reader for taking the action you want them to take. Speaking also of the message, a recent article from CIO.com suggests that describing an IT initiative from a business perspective first helps those outside of IT understand its business value and impact. The example is rather than name a CRM upgrade project, boring old CRM 3.2 upgrade, which we're guilty of, name it enhanced CRM customer analytics. Why would this be important? Well, for the non-IT people, a simple name hack like this can imply business improvement or modernization and a positive impact to their role in the company, which basically what they do and how they do it. So they'll likely be supportive of the initiative rather than taking focus on the downside of change for the sake of change. And if you also describe the project as a way to increase sales, market share, and competitive advantage, the project itself becomes much more difficult to argue against. So we can see that idea in an actual report out. This loop demonstrates exactly what this hack is about. The architect is updating the title on the dashboard from the CRM 3.2 upgrade to the name that implies the, business, uh, the resulting business transformation and value. It's a very simple task to do in Abacus Enterprise. And also note that the architect highlights the customer experience rating um, as projected from the transformation quite prominently. You can see the 82.1% uh, right there in the center of the dashboard. Showing a metric like this is a persuasion technique that makes it difficult to argue against the initiative. Another great hack we like from Gartner is to always default to the positive. No doubt you've heard the phrase, you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. And it's very true with professional messaging. Now this does not mean um, to sugarcoat or purposely mislead about unfortunate situations. But being outwardly optimistic about reasons and results 
is a good kind of viral. Gartner's hack is to start every communication with what's working well, and if there's a positive expectation, be sure and mention it up front. And we take that hack a little further. We think that if you write your communication with a smile and deliver your communication with a smile, you can bet that whoever reads or hears it will sense the positivity and success. So let's see examples of a great and a not so great communication. First, take a look at this high energy positive message. The author is excited, happy about the progress made, sharing that the work supports future successes using elements of now and later. There's a shout out to cost savings discovered, and there's optimism about the completion time frame. Yay! Now, contrast that to this short and not really so sweet message. It's nearly the same information, but it's worlds apart on the softer side of messaging. The sharing of value, successes, and optimism to stakeholders is quite absent. Getting your message content and tone right exhibits that professional competence McKinsey spoke of. So the first message, great model for using positivity as a hack to inform, involve, and excite. Whereas the second message is your anti-model. Whoops. Completely, uh, it's, it's void, it's valueless and void of um, excite, excitement. So while text-based messages are useful, leaders, leaders and decision makers typically expect visual messages also. When you provide visualizations, it's important to focus and aggregate information to the audience's concerns and interests. Those attention getting, bottom line information that your CIO and decision makers thrive on and rely on for decision making. Abacus Enterprise is where you can put up dashboards for your various audiences. For example, to show that an initiative's expected results align with strategic direction. In this dashboard, you can see that the topmost area is the best place for the key message. In other words, what's the goal of the dashboard? Here is to compare a, a, compare a current state and a to be state supporting a call to action to approve this ERP cloud migration initiative. As you communicate using enterprise, be sure to provide the decision factors and quantitative measures that are important to the audience. Tell stories that relate only to their concerns. Because remember, as we saw in the graph view example, you can unintentionally overwhelm. And to that point, this architect uses the current state and target state data, both visually and numerically, to compare the current state and to be, highlighting cost, availability, and the customer experience ratings. They're highly visible in the center of the dashboard, and the data projects that the ERP migration from on-prem to cloud-hosted is a worthwhile initiative. It should be very difficult to argue against the case. And also, uh, when creating visuals for specific audiences, remember our old friend, The Viewpoint in Abacus Studio to help build your EA branding. Consistent and uniform diagrams and visualizations are more likely to grow stakeholders' appetites for information provided by enterprise architects. So taking from a Gartner article called How to Make People Care About Your Transformation, we like this suggestion for an elevator pitch for transformation. Using some of the earlier hacks mentioned, this elevator pitch sticks to the idea of plain business language, business outcomes and objectives, and indicators of headway and success. And it's short. 
This is a perfect template to have at the beginning of any change effort so architects and the project crew can have it memorized and at the ready for chance meetings with inquiring stakeholders. I've got a couple examples of the transformation and objects. One could be the company's transforming into a customer first based organization in order to improve customer reviews and customer retention. Another could be we're transforming to a new expense reporting process in order to simplify the steps needed by associates to report business expenses. And note in this example, which I won't read for you, there is a plus. So in your pitches, take advantage of every opportunity to list benefits and value adds that are relevant to the right stakeholder. So in closing, it's possible to find or dream up tons of tips and tricks and hacks for effective communication. And any one of these hacks shared today are obviously hackable themselves. So if you embark on any found hacks, you don't have to follow them step by step. You should make them work for you. After all, that's what a hack is, right? But I do hope you're able to take away some new ideas to use or hack even further by incorporating the language of business, audience awareness, and other soft skills so that you can up your communication and messaging, messaging game. And do remember, be truthful, be clear, be complete, be present, be positive, and be respectful. Uh, Melissa, I'm happy to take any comments or questions from the audience if there are any. Great, sounds wonderful. Thanks so much, Doreen. That was that was wonderful. Thank um, you. Just to start off, we we have so many attendees tuning in from different countries today, which is really really neat. Um, yeah. And someone pointed out that all of these perspectives have a cultural component across global audiences. Essentially, um, is there anything that you would suggest, or and or would you change your advice in any way when it comes to communicating with audiences across the globe? You know, um, I guess multicultural audiences as opposed to maybe an audience from just one particular country. That is a really good call out. Um, yeah, I did kind of have blinders on when I wrote this. Um, so apologies, no offense intended, but it would absolutely be hackable. <laughs> like I mentioned at the end, every hack is hackable. If you like something in here, it must reflect your culture, your ways of doing business. Um, not only say your um, human culture, but your, um, uh, your operational culture, your enterprise culture as well. So please hack everything to make them work for you, make them acceptable and um, adoptable by uh, anyone you present them with. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah, and I think, I think something can certainly be taken from this for um, any type of audience, which, which is great and can be adjusted to, to fit that. <clears throat> um, so we've also, you know, got someone that's pointed out that, you know, emotional intelligence is probably more important for this role than, than people might think that it is. <laughs> um, and then I think also talking about empathy, um, you know, we've also got someone else that's talked about how true, genuine business empathy isn't simple. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of combining emotional intelligence and, and empathy, which I think go somewhat hand in hand, you know, how can someone improve their emotional intelligence and how can you project genuine empathy? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I did not call out that EQ, uh, EQ um, side of that. It really is the foundation for empathy. And I believe there, um, I know in the past I have taken myself some of the soft skill courses that LinkedIn offers on emotion, your emotional quotient um, are very helpful and they speak highly of the things that you can do. So it's kind of a personal development. And as you learn, as you um, tame your emotional intelligence, which I think, you know, to your, to the question um, person's point, you do have to tame that when you're um, trying to empathize with the, the, your, your stakeholder, because you know, like I said, your mind is full of all the causations and reasons and, and the, oh no, we're going to have to do this next. 
But that, that strength in your emotional intelligence um, should one day train you to face that person straight on with open eyes, open ears, and the open heart and the open mind to really listen. And um, can't be underrated. De definitely a part of empathizing. That's great. So those courses, it seems like have helped you. So that's a great yes. suggestion. Yeah, excellent. Um, yeah, and kind of going along with that, when you were talking about the curse of knowledge, I myself um, <laughs> was was thinking about the fact that, you know, I think it's important and, and maybe ties in a little bit to to empathy and emotional intelligence. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll forget that not everybody has the same knowledge as me, you know, and, right. and, and kind of, you know, need to keep that in mind and think about that when communicating with with certain audiences that I may have all of this information in my head, but yeah. they do not necessarily have that. Um, and on on the flip side, the information mm -hmm. they do have in their head is theirs, you know, so they have right. they could easily have that same curse and maybe can't get past um, something they know that will be a, a, a hurdle or a challenge because and they're keeping that to themselves because they just know it to be the case. Well, you know, a, a really savvy enterprise architect could work in a way to extract that information and maybe put that concern to rest. Oh no, we can get around that. You know, it, it won't affect your night shift that much or yada, you know, things like that, examples that um, to ease their mind. That, that's really um, the goal, you know, to, to break down the curses that both of the parties have. Right, and try and put yourself in their shoes as well yeah. to yeah. think about it from their perspective and, and what would make sense for them. So that's great. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you have any particular trainings that you could recommend, but someone did ask if you have any specific trainings that you would recommend for effective communication. Um, I know you mentioned you know, that you in the past have done some LinkedIn learning and trainings mm -hmm. and you know, probably just a general search on there would pull up some, some really great ones, but yeah. um, were, are there any other specific ones that you would, would suggest? I really can't cite, um, you know, any particular books or, um, you know, web offerings that I've had, but um, just to not maybe muddy the water, but um, some of these uh, analyst groups and the publications, they, they publish frequently, and it just becomes a little bit of critical thinking. It's like, if you read it, would you, would you find this helpful? You know, and again, hack it if it's not completely helpful, um, use half of it or combine two of them. So it becomes an exercise, of not a, it's like a little treasure hunt. You know, if, if you sure. know you're having tr a trouble with something, maybe do some keyword searches on that and then read a couple and put them together and try that technique. And nobody has to know where you got it and that you're trying something new. If it works for you, improve upon it. If it doesn't work for you, start over. <laughs> right, right. Well, and I'd imagine as well, Doreen, you know, in addition to maybe some some training on effective communication, it probably mm -hmm. would also help to maybe ask some of, of the folks that you are presenting to or, or communicating with for, for feedback. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Like how well received was that? Did, did it make any, did it help you think um, about your problem differently? Did it help you make did it did it help you understand where the company wants to go go and how you fit into that? Or yes, I, I totally agree with you. Feedback from the audience is super important. Excellent. Great. So we have two questions related to communication channels, essentially. Okay. Um, so, you know, the first one is is basically should it be on omni channel? So, so things like SharePoint, presentation, mm -hmm. teams, workshops, seminar, et cetera. Like, you know, what should it be on? And, and um, going along with that, should the same format or different formats for the same message be used? So we'll start there. And then I've got a <laughs> kind of an additional question. Yeah. Um, throughout my experience, I, I pick up things from mentors and what have you. And, and uh, one of my mentors said frequently, um, communicate seven ways, seven times. <laughs> so mm -hmm. fill in the number that you want, nine ways, nine times. But the same message available through multiple channels, multiple um, visuals, you know, because everybody picks up a message in a different man manner. Some people are very visual. Some people like to read it and, and digest it. Some people have to hear it, you know, from somebody else. So yeah, the, the more <laughs> might be the better. That makes sense. Great. And then 
how about those teams that are using, you know, quote unquote, old school communic communication tools so that organizations may be accustomed to. So something like PowerPoint and, and mm -hmm. things like that. How would you recommend moving your team away from, from those types of tools to maybe some more effective communication yeah. methods? Good question. I think in the case of um, an enterprise architecture management tool like Abacus that stays that is dynamic and real time all the time, it might be some baby steps. So you would develop your dashboards for that audience. You know, here are the, the decision points or just the, the portfolio, the condition of the portfolio or the risk, what, what, whatever your live and dynamic dashboard is, start off gradually by, you know, snapping a pic of it, you know, take a screenshot of it and put it in a PowerPoint. And then, you know, try to prompt the uh, conversation with that person, lead the witness, <laughs> subtly coach them to, if you want to see this real time, let me show you this. Don't force them to go there if they don't want to. Um, offer the idea. It's like, you know, if I click this link, it'll show me that and uh, in real time. And everybody will see it real time. So we don't have to worry about this PowerPoint going obsolete. And then over time, you know, you can do more and more of that coach, 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 coach. And then eventually they may say, hey, Mr. or Miss Enterprise Architect, pop me that link where I could see that that visual of, you know, the the data that I want. So, you know, it's it, it can't really be a, a, a one step jump. Folks that are really stuck in that old world, they they have to be subtly coached to go there. <laughs> That makes sense. Change is hard. It, it, when, Change when you're is hard. When you're working with something that you've you've always known, or you know at least have known for for quite a while, and that's the way you've been doing it, it's it's mm -hmm. tough to do that. So I think you're right. Just kind of continuing to coach and and remind and mm -hmm. and kind of push and drive that um, that new method, and and hopefully they'll get used to it eventually. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah. Um, we had another question. Um, someone mentioned having a deep knowledge of the business value and the criticality of an application. Is it easier to approach an enterprise architecture? So if you do have that deep knowledge, does that make it easier? Even if you do have the deep knowledge, I kind of subscribe to the fact that it's the business who should be um, articulating that knowledge. Now, if you got it from the business, maybe you came from the business, okay, sure enough. But we always want a business counterpart to confirm what we believe we know. And if you've got that um, counterpart on your side, you are on their side, you are this partnership and you believe the same things, then I do believe um, everything about, appro well, I won't say everything, a lot of things about approaching that particular application and its place in the enterprise architecture um, will, will be you know, simplified in a way because you'll be able to apply more properties to it, apply more dependencies to it, apply more, um, not only uh, dependencies, not only technical, but the business dependencies. And then also how the strategy, uh, how it's gonna fit in with the direction of the, of the company. So knowledge is never bad, unless, you know, I'll use that caveat, if you can't tuck it away for just a little bit <laughs> and be present in the, present in the moment. Um, I hope that helped. <laughs> Sure. No, that, that makes sense. Great. All right. So I think we've actually answered all of the questions just in time. Um, so yeah. thanks again, Doreen. And thanks again to everyone who was able to join us. Thank you.